bonjour, or hello. My name is Dennis Rundeman, and today we will be talking about Cecile Chaminade's Concertino for Flute and Piano, Opus 107. So let's start with a little bit of background history. So Cecile Chaminade is actually a very famous um, French female composer. And it was really interesting because there weren't a lot of French composers at that time in history. Um, and the piece that she wrote specifically for flute and piano was commissioned by the Paris Conservatory in 1902. Um, originally, the intention of this piece was to be used as an examination piece for the flute students at that time. The teacher at that school was actually Paul Taffanel. And you know, we all know that name, uh, Taffanel and Gobert, you know, the scales, all of that stuff. And so it's really interesting to kind of connect those two people with this time frame at the early 1900s. Her style of composition is very late romantic in style, so it includes um, quite a bit of chromaticism, it's very romantic, very expressive lines, long lines. Um, and so if we were to talk about one thing about the piece that I love, or what do I love about the piece, I just really love the fact that it has a very strong outline, but also a lot of room for creativity and a lot of room for adding your own colors and your own expressions to the piece. Um, so that's one of my favorite things. So I'm just going to start off by playing the opening, just to give you a little bit of taste. I'll play um, the first four stanzas, so up to, um, let's see, up to measure 17. So that's like the opening phrase, and actually this time I stopped at measure 15 instead of the 17. Um, but that's the opening phrase, and already you can just hear there's a lot of long lines. It goes up, it goes down, and that's constantly happening. Um, and so one of the key features about this opening is very pastoral. Um, it has the hills and the valleys. And so one of the key things with this um, opening and throughout the piece is just making sure that the piece itself does not lose tempo. Because the tendency often will be to do this, you know, it's just so uh, graceful and so expressive that you just want to give every measure as much love as possible. And it could sound like this. And already you see every measure gets slower and slower and that causes the piece, you know, it's very expressive. It does sound satisfying in a way, but then also you kind of want the piece to move along a little bit. So you want to make sure that it doesn't slow down too far and constantly thinking of each measure driving towards the next measure. Um, let's see. So now what I'm going to do, since we're only talking about um, the first exposition of the piece, so pretty much the first page, um, I'll play a little bit of the faster section just to kind of give you that taste of um, already the um, diversity and just the, I guess, the, um, the complexity that comes a little bit later in the piece and how that contrasts with the opening. So this is beginning at 15, con continuing on. So it kind of tricks you a little bit, you know, we went into this very um, technical section and then it just resolves back to that opening, very calm sense that we had at the beginning. 
Um, one thing to really think about with this, um, if we go back to the opening phrase, is you're always, because the hills kind of happen before the downbeat of the next measure, you might tend to go to the highest note. But here's what that would sound like. And it doesn't have the same effect as if you went through it to the next note. If you constantly think of leading your air to the downbeat of the next measure, it's naturally going to give the, the piece the motion that you're looking for. Um, okay, so there's that. Of course, the entire technical area that I just played has a ton of um, tricky little spots. One thing that's really helpful, if you have a C-sharp key, using that whenever you have to go between the B natural and the C-sharp is really helpful. So like... And if you don't have one, you would just use the old-fashioned way. Both of them sound great. Um, one may take a little bit more finesse to get that, uh, the muscle memory there, but definitely if you do have the C-sharp trill key, that's very helpful. Because this piece does have quite a few cross fingerings here in the opening section, you want to make sure there's not a lot of flubs happening between the notes. You want to make sure they're nice and smooth. So specifically watch out going from E to F or F sharp. You don't want to get that flub. You can sound like, which is not as clean as, which just carries on. And also whenever you have large interval, interval jumps, you wanna make sure that you're already thinking of where you're headed before you get there. Um, so making sure that they don't pop out of the texture and make sure that they're smooth. So like. So before I even get to that E natural, I'm already thinking about it before. Thinking about the E natural. which creates a nice smooth arc to it. So that's one thing that I would mention um, in the technical passage with all the fast stuff. That can just sound like a monster to accomplish. Make sure that you don't rush it. You know, you wanna make sure what I did right then and there was actually a little bit rushed, but you have time, especially with the pianist. The pianist just has downbeat chords there, so you can really take your time there. Make sure that we're hearing every single note. That's very important. Um, and I guess the last thing that I would say, um, what skills did this piece help me accomplish? Um, so right off the back, one of them is longer phrasing. Um, so not thinking of, of the music in chunks like. As one phrase and then. As a separate, but thinking of them as connected. What I did there is I really disguised that breath so that you get the long line. So that's another thing, making sure whenever you breathe that the breaths don't distract from the tempo or the flow of the piece, um, making sure that they fit in seamlessly and it keeps pushing forward. Um, that's one thing that it taught me. Another thing is just, you know, having power and um, good tone starting in your low register. All the way down there. The middle register, all the way up to the high. And just being able to make sure that they all speak clearly and all smoothly is really important. Um, and I guess the last thing that I would say is just the whole aspect of French flute style playing. Um, it's so important to practice this style of playing so that you know you have different ornamentations to use whenever you're playing other pieces or just having, um, I guess, a wealth of tools in your toolbox is really important. So this is definitely one of those pieces that you know every player should play. Um, and really make it your own so that you know you can have that um, expressive power and just learn the skills of the French flutist from the 1900s, which is very helpful.